Good evening. My name is Robert Lim. I'm the chair of the SAGES Acute Care Committee, and tonight I'm pleased to host the second in a series of free SAGES webinars to assist with the surgical response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight's webinar has been accredited by the Council for Continuing Education, and physicians can claim 1.5 CME credits for this activity. All registrants will be emailed a link for CME after the webinar. These are the disclosures for tonight's events. None of these relationships is related to tonight's activity. The objective tonight is to familiarize the audience with SAGES' recommendations and statements related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and to help the audience implement these recommendations at their own institutions. This webinar will be available to the public within a few days via the SAGES website. <clears throat> the audience will have the ability to ask questions using the chat function of their Zoom application. We will do our best to answer the questions as we can, as many questions as we can live. We will also have a brief panel session at the end of the presentations. We will answer some questions there also. After this event is over, we will collect the questions and answer them, and those answers will, be, will also be published online through the website. Finally, there will, be a links, there will be links to the references of this webinar for the audience to access after this event. SAGES aims to provide the most accurate and reliable information in this ever-changing crisis. This is our esteemed faculty for tonight's event. To give us an overview of tonight's event, I will turn the microphone over to the current SAGES president, Horacio Aspen, who has done a tremendous job of leading us to this pandemic. Dr. Aspen. Thank you, uh, Rob. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Um, I'm very excited about this uh, second webinar. Last week, we had a very successful webinar and that uh, all of you can access in, the, at our web, in our web, web page. And we have had very good feedback. Because of it, we decided to do a follow-up. This is a different webinar than what it was last week. And I'm very excited about our speakers. Uh, Rob will be telling you in detail, but basically we have people here that have been in the, in the ground in Liberia, uh, on the times of Ebola. We have people that are currently in the ground in New York at Mount Sinai, and they're gonna give us first count event of what. We will be talking also about technical um, procedures like tracheostomy, and we also have people that have author papers that are going, that are now used as references during this crisis, and we have the opportunity to have them with us. Um, I want to also thank the WAST for sharing some of the material that will be presented today, particularly the guidelines for tracheostomy, et cetera. And uh, I don't want to take more of the time. Uh, we have an excited, exciting webinar coming. Rob, please um, introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and Dr. Cripps, you can uh, start to share yours. Um, Dr. Cripps comes to us from uh, University of uh, Texas Southwestern uh, and Parkland Hospital. Um, he is a, a, a co-chair of the acute care co committee with me, also a trauma surgeon and the medical director for disaster management at Parkland Hospital. He has organized his hospital's response and preparation for the surge in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Cripps. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so we're gonna spend the next few minutes talking about <clears throat> allocating resources during the COVID pandemic. And, you know, I think surgeons are uniquely uh, prepared to help assist during this uh, response. I think every hospital needs to stand up their uh, hospital incident command system uh, during these types of responses. And I think a surgeon needs to be involved in those <clears throat> because we can provide uh, unique input to hospital utilization and in the workforce. And I'm gonna discuss that in this talk. So, uh, since outbreak, a lot of guidelines and recommendations have come out, and I understand that not all of those guidelines are applicable to every institution, and this uh, talk is no different. And also, states and cities will have their own local regional regulations on some of these uh, stand-ups. But what I tell everybody that's called about this is have a plan, but also be adaptive to the situation. Take a look around and see what's happening. A couple of resources that are good to use are the FEMA National Incident Management System has a great resource for that. Also, the California EMS Service Authority has a great handbook on uh, uh, tips and guidelines for standing up your own hospital incident command system. So when we stood up our incident command system at the beginning of this outbreak, we really focused on four principles, and that was protecting the healthcare workers, 
maximizing our treatment capacity, increasing the testing capability, and maximizing our staff pool. And although the maximizing the treatment capacity and staff pool is what I'm gonna talk about here, and these occurred simultaneously, I'm gonna take these one at a time. So we'll start with the treatment uh, capacity. So when you look at the Department of Homeland Security's threat hazard uh, risk assessment, they really tell you to look at five things. What do you need to prepare for? What are your capabilities? What's the gap between what you need and what your capabilities are? And how you're gonna address those capability gaps. And so when we looked at this and we said, COVID-19 is a droplet spread virus, but it also has some aerosolization uh, capabilities and you're gonna need negative pressure rooms for this. Uh, <clears throat> that was what we needed to prepare for. And when we looked at our initial uh, assessment, the initial projection said that in our area, we were gonna have to prepare for anywhere from 50 to 5,000 patients for critical care. And we only had 25 negative pressure rooms. So immediately on the outset, we identified that we had a significant uh, deficit that we needed to correct for. So uh, the first thing that we did in our command, uh, hospital command structure was we adjusted our staffing. So instead of just having the incident commander and the, the medical director for disaster management, first person we brought in was executive management uh, to be down in with co-leadership with the incident commander. That way we didn't have to have any committees, anything to get decisions made or approvals that could happen in the command center with rapid uh, turnaround time. Then we brought in our technical specialist, the infectious disease doctor and the medical critical care because they're really on the front lines of this. So we didn't have to want to call out, find out what their recommendations were, then put them back through the command center. They're in there, they're with us, they're helping us make guide those decisions on a real time basis. And then we brought in operations, planning, logistics, and finance, all for the same reason. They're in the room, they're with us. We can make those decisions real time and push those through uh, with speed. And then we decided we were gonna roll out our response in four phases, which is just our own local terminology for what we used. So in our first phase, we canceled all the elective surgeries and just went to emergency case only. Then we decided we we're gonna put all of our uh, initial COVID patients in the medical ICU. And we're gonna keep our SICU open for the non-COVID patients. And then immediately at this point is when we started our construction on phase two. And this is where really the surgeons played a key role in here. And that was because when they asked us what our normal overflow pattern is for the surgical ICU, we said it's down in the post anesthesia care unit. And we recognized that at the time that's not negative pressure, but since we had engineering in our command structure, they said, hey, with a, a few simple constructions, we can turn that into negative exhaust. And so with the negative exhaust, it protects the hospital. And this is actually what we did. And this is our actual blueprint here. So down here is our post anesthesia care unit. So this is where we originally started looking at an overflow situation for COVID patients. And each one of these areas is a curtained unit that we could place a, an intubated critically ill patient. And then we said, well, the engineering told us that this whole area would have to be negative exhaust. And we said, good because then we could put a couple of patients in each of these ORs, and then our pre-op holding area over here could hold sort of the ward COVID patients. So now we have a whole COVID tank, if you will. And this did a lot of things, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, but it increased our staffing ratio. So you can see down here, one physician could easily identify and take care of multiple patients in one area, same for over here. Furthermore, once you enter this area, you have your PPE for your shift, and there's not a lot of, uh, donning and doffing of the PPE, so it really limits the amount of potential risk for self-contamination. So after this, we decided our third phase would be to do the exact same thing on the other half of our ORs. And then after that, we started looking outside the box, and a lot of areas were setting up tents outside hospitals, looking at cafeterias, anywhere that we could say we could cohort a large number of patients. And for us, what ended up being one of the easiest solutions was our decon area down in our ambulance bay. So in that area, again, using the trauma surgeons in there said, hey, we already have electricity, water, and it, the plumbing is already all put into place. So with two walls and an exhaust, now we have another area we can largely cohort patients. It's very comfortable. It's a very easy place for them to be. Uh, and then with this concept of this negative exhaust, we're able to start utilizing half of three of our floors to do the same thing through those exhaust systems, which now brings us an additional 100 rooms that we could use for potential COVID utilization. And then 
Then after that, we could start doubling up occupancy in each one of these areas. And so you, now you can see how these, each one of these areas are gonna stack on top of each other to easily accommodate a very, very large number of patients in a very short amount of time frame. And then if we needed to, we could go to a phase four, which is alternative ventilation strategies. Now that takes care of the sort of the real estate geography of the hospital. Now, when you talk about the staffing, the first thing that we put out to folks is that this is not gonna be business as usual. And the first thing we're gonna do is as fast as we can offload our frontline people, the hospitalists and the critical care. So all the general surgeons and the surgical specialists are gonna take everything onto their service that they would normally put on the hospital service, like pancreatitis, diverticulitis, peripheral arterial disease, any of these sort of diseases they can do, they're gonna bring them back into their own service lines. The trauma critical care surgeons are gonna offload the emergency general surgery services and then they're going to prepare to initially take care of the medical critical care patients that uh, aren't COVID and then start bolstering up from when they would help take care of the MICU COVID patients. So as that last line as they continue to take care of trauma patients. So when we did this, we first thing we did is uh, figure out who's all critical care trained, understanding that not all critical care trained folks are going to be able to do this because of either age or comorbid disease. So we need to figure out who our pool was. And then, as I said, simultaneous with our maximizing capacity, try to increase the number of patients per doctor in every situation that we could. And then we repeated this process for our critical care nurses. And this really follows the tiered staffing strategy put out forth by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, which says you take one lead critical care trained physician and then tier it up underneath them. In our institution, we really utilized our APPs and the CRNAs, the Certified uh, Registered Nurse Anesthetists, because those individuals can intubate, run vents, place lines, and our ICU APPs can run critical care, place lines, run vents. So that really allowed us to uh, magnify the number of patients that we can take care of under a single critical care physician. And I think that that's the most important part of this tiered approach is to figure out who else within your system can help coordinate that. And we understand that's always gonna be different, but to maximize our resources. And don't forget about the other critical care docs, the surgical critical care and the neurocritical care. Remembering that people are still gonna have strokes, there's still gonna be trauma, but figure out where you can tier those folks into the system. So in conclusion, I think the most important thing to remember is it's not going to be business as usual. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Let that be the message. Um, use your incident command center to implement your emergency operation procedure and have all your information funnel through and out through them. Set it up so that they can make rapid decisions without a lot of discussion and outside uh, interventions. Then maximize your resources to care for as many patients as you can with as few providers as you can to provide the best outcomes. And with that, I'll thank you, and I look forward to your questions at the end of the discussion. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, our next speaker could go up and share his screen. I'll introduce him. Um, coming to us from the Charlotte, North Carolina, is Dr. Sam Ross, uh, who will discuss the tiered surgical approach to uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic. You heard Dr. Cripps talk about the uh, structural changes and how to align your faculty um, he will talk a little more in detail about that, as well as uh, what to do with your trainees during this time. His paper just came out in March 2020, uh, 2020 uh, and Jack's uh, discussing it, and he's the first author on these papers. So with that, Dr. Ross. Uh, I'd like to thank Sages and Dr. Lim and Dr. Esburn for having me here. Um, so uh, just a little outline of what we're going to be talking about, a little bit of uh, principles to consider as you're uh, talking about how you're going to form this phased uh, plan, uh, have a blueprint for the, the surge as it comes in. And then our four phases for ours is a little different and I'll actually give a little bit of how does, it, how does this correlate to the SAGES plan as well as to uh, like uh, Dr. Cripps's Parkland plan. So in the beginning of March, we were uh, very concerned as this uh, was evident that it was going to become a pandemic. So we started putting a, a plan in place even before it was declared a pandemic and before kind of the, the national emergency started. And we wanted to use, uh, starting on our incident command structure, as Dr. Cripps uh, alludes to, in our structure, we had an alert level, level two and level one, and we added an additional level on there looking at what was happening in Italy, um, uh, condition zero. And this, this is when it's really an austere environment, kind of a warlike footing. And I'll go through some of the principles that kind of guided us as we were creating this plan. So we've all seen the, the um, 
graph here about social distancing and why we need to flatten the curve. And uh, I think we all get the, the point that we are flattening the curve uh, in a lot of places and kind of spacing out um, and over a longer period of time, the amount of patients that are being infected. However, what we also need to be doing is increasing that line that's there. So the healthcare system capacity and number of ICU beds and ventilators, and this really feeds into the, the plan that I'll be discussing. Other things that uh, we also wanted to touch on were residents and medical students. How, how do you um, manage the trainees and, and utilize them without actually uh, having them at increased risk? And for residents and fellows, these are uh, trained, um, especially in the kind of the higher tiers, PGY four, five, six, seven. They are um, very uh, trained in critical care and, and how to manage these patients and manage floor patients as well. And so, as you get higher in our uh, in our um, uh, phase as our tiers, you're really going to give these uh, residents, these senior residents, graduated autonomy. Uh, that's for chief residents, for fellows, they can get their own uh, services. And, and I've, I've seen this in, um, uh, in Italy and, and New York and some other places talking to people around the world that uh, they, this is really happening on the ground that chiefs and fellows are getting their own services where they're the acting attending. You can also use these senior residents to backfill EGS and trauma uh, for the acute care surgery service um, and really let those acute care surgeons really focus on the ICU. Another thing that we've done here is cycle those residents in and out as well as the attendings and actually have uh, five days on, five days off and they don't cross paths so that they won't cross contaminate each other. Uh, so they don't have one resident getting uh, sick and then um, infecting all the rest of the residents in, in that entire class or um, all the whole residents in the entire program. Another thing you can do with these residents is have a procedural team um, and have them actually go and place lines, place chest tubes, uh, uh, put in uh, even Foley's and NG tubes if need be. Um, for the medical students, a little bit harder a question. So um, some places I know are considering early graduation for their um, fourth year students, um, but most of the schools in the country have actually pulled um, most of their students from clinical rotations and really I think the risk uh, of those medical students actually outweighs the benefit of actually helping any of the uh, patients. We all remember kind of our intern days. We um, didn't know the dose of Tylenol, so throwing them into the, the meat grinder, so to speak, is, is not gonna be the, the best uh, for their benefit. One other thing that we considered was advanced triage criteria. So in places like Italy, uh, we heard stories of not intubating patients over 60, no, no ICU for patients over 80. And so we wanted to, to have kind of uh, some uh, standards of how we approach this. This is actually a graph from uh, the Colorado system, and thanks to Dr. Berlou for uh, giving me this. Um, so this um, is actually a triage system that utilizes both uh, the SOFA score as well as the modified Charleston comorbidity index. And if you have higher scores, um, that's you're gonna have worse prognosis. And so what you want to do is have lower scores and the people with lower scores would then be triaged to get those um, higher utilization so they would be in ICU. They would get the uh, ventilators. Um, and then if someone ties, then you would go down and, and uh, pediatrics would come first and then healthcare workers because you want to get them healthy to get back into the fight. After that, pregnant um, uh, females as well as people who are single caregivers, so like single mom, or um, if it's a, a young patient, you want to be able to get those patients um, uh, back into the uh, workforce to contribute to society. So um, a little bit um, as we were uh, developing this, um, Sages also came out with the kind of uh, phases and then you just heard from Dr. Cripps about Parkland's uh, different phases. Um, and I wanted to kind of get a little bit of a Rosetta Stone. We all ha have four different uh, phases and what we're really talking about is from a readiness standpoint, which we kind of have all passed, to adapting to the um, increased patient volume and then getting inundated by uh, patients. And then what New York is experiencing, and you'll hear a little bit later on what New York is like right now, where you're really overwhelmed and you're just trying to um, save as many patients as you can. Um, and this is a little bit of a, a Rosetta Stone for, for those different things. So we all know we're kind of what phase we're talking about. So getting into the, the specifics here that we developed at Carolina, this is kind of the alert level. This is where we were back in uh, early March. So we, we have a pandemic level, we have a potential impact to the facility, but there's really not any COVID patients there yet. 
Uh, and we want this to really be able to be uh, generalizable to any facility, whether it's a tertiary facility or if it's a community hospital. Uh, these type of um, planning structure should be able to be generalized to, to anywhere. Um, and so uh, you still have your full complement. You still have um, all your staff at the hospital. No one's really been furloughed. So what the department can do to get ready is to start screening patients for a clinic in the OR, um, do teleclinic, do as much telemedicine as possible, and then furlough all the non-patient facing staff. That means um, any research or quality improvement personnel, administrative personnel, they really don't need to be in the hospital if it's a risk getting uh, infected. Uh, we've all kind of uh, done this at our institutions already. And then you're gonna prioritize your cases for cardiovascular, cancer, urgent and emergent status. A lot of places are also uh, canceling any elective cases at this point. What we've actually done is cancel any non-essential cases. So anything that's uh, cardiovascular or cancer, we're still doing within kind of a reasonable time frame. And then for the acute care service, we're still kind of having the same staffing model, but we're really focusing uh, on uh, covering the EGS, the ICU and the trauma service. The facility itself at, at this point is gonna start doing a sit rep with the incident command structure, set up mobile testing, uh, do triage tents, uh, and trying to minimize kind of the routine visits. For transfer criteria, we really wanna focus on transfers as well to limit the amount of transfers that are coming into the tertiary center so you can really focus on these really critically ill patients. The next level is level two. So at this point, we're actually getting some COVID patients. You're having some potential impact on the system uh, and you're having possibly patients, uh, or sorry, possibly uh, surgeons getting infected as well. So we're expecting surgeons as well as the ICU staff, as well as the operating room staff to starting to get infected. So uh, these are some criteria that we set here on the left side, less than 20% hospital bed availability, less than 25 ICU bed avail availability. But what we've actually experienced here in Charlotte is uh, once we have started reducing the amount of elective case volume, we've actually went from operating at about 105%, uh, which is what our, we normally do, down to about 60%. So that gives us a big buffer to actually uh, kind of come up to the next level. So for the department at this level, really trying to decrease the amount of elective cases, these non-essential cases are already stopped. So things like inguinal hernias, ventral hernias have been stopped, but cancer cases uh, that still need to go can, can go. Um, one thing that really is helpful to, is to set up a surgical review board and they actually go through the case list by day and, and before the day and make sure that nothing is getting on there like a, a benign hysterectomy or something like that. And then try to cancel those high risk patients as well. And then one thing with the residents, now that um, it's having more patient, more COVID patients in the hospital, you can start uh, transferring those residents to ICU, EGS, and trauma rotations because those elective services are really drawing down. So really that's gonna be the core of where residents and APPs are gonna flex to is the ICU, EGS, and, and trauma. At this point, the, the acute care surgery service is still maintaining those three service lines, uh, and, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, for the facility, we're still doing the daily sit reps. We're having expanded patient uh, ratios. Um, um, and also we're uh, having ECMO um, uh, triage uh, criteria. Um, for the operating rooms, we're having about a 50% drawdown. Then as we get to level one, this is when things are really starting to, to heat up. Our facility, we're expecting to get over 100% uh, percent capacity, ICUs over 90% capacity. And then we're having decreasing resources at the facility. So um, these are gonna have potential impacts such as the, the blood bank not having enough blood. We're not able to discharge patients to SNFs and, and uh, rehab. So you're really getting a log jam of patients who are um, there for other reasons who you can't get out of the hospital because those places are concerned that they have uh, COVID as well. And then we're having more and more um, personnel being furloughed. So at this point is when the, the acute care surgery service uh, really needs to start focusing uh, on the ICU and severe trauma. And we actually came up with a tiered system for um, those other surgeons, so general surgery trained um, surgeons, to have uh, trauma and EGS responsibilities. This tier one, general surgery, hepatobiliary, vascular, and acute care surgery fellows, they're gonna have a graduate responsibility, start taking up um, EGS, um, and then those uh, tier two and three are taking medical patients as well. Also at this time, what we're planning is actually to expand the number of ICU beds. And the way that we're gonna do that is actually uh, doubling up in our normal ICUs and then expanding to pre-op, expanding to PACU and to uh, endoscopy recovery and one day surgery, places like that that have those monitored bed capabilities. 
uh, and, and, and this model, we are actually going to increase our ICU capacity by about 300%. Also, increasing the wards uh, by increasing to, uh, to waiting rooms and the cafeteria and places like that, um, and increasing that by uh, 200%. For this standpoint, we're going to stop doing the uh, non-emergent transfers and really prioritize uh, trauma and uh, people who need surgical critical care to, to be there. Um, also, I should note at this point really has stopped any elective thing if, if something can't get done within uh, or shouldn't get done within two days we're really not not doing it and then last the condition zero this is really the austere environment the wartime footing where the facility is at greater than 125 capacity icu greater than 100 percent and that's with those those new numbers so if you increase your your icu by 300 percent with these measures and then you're still getting to that capacity um, uh, that's over 300% of what you were before. So we're expecting increasing uh, admissions at this point, really exponential growth. And this is a kind of a catastrophic setting. Um, you're having more and more people being furloughed and uh, being infected. So in this uh, scenario, the acute care surgeons really just focus on ICU. And so that all the trauma is now being taken by those tier one surgeons. Uh, all the EGS by the tier two, and then the tier three surgeons uh, from that slide before are going to be taking um, medical uh, patients. All um, the residents, fellows, staff are really going to flex to those roles uh, that I mentioned earlier. And then uh, PGY4s can really be as like acting fellows since they're, they're senior residents um, and can do procedures and place lines. Um, also, at this time, you're going to have advanced triage criteria for the, those trauma patients and for mechanical ventilation. Uh, as well as um, potential futility policies for things like code blue activation. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and then uh, for the facility itself, you're going to have to start uh, creating ICUs out of the OR, like Dr. Cripps was saying. At our facilities, um, we don't have as uh, many uh, ORs as, as Parkland. You can see my thing. I actually trained at Parkland as well. Um, but uh, what you can do is convert the ORs that you do have and then have anesthesia because a lot of these anesthesiologists are critical care trained and can manage the patients who are, who are placed into those kind of OR ICUs. Um, the Society of Critical Care Medicine is actually recommended against doing tandem ventilators or two patients on a ventilator. So that's something that could be considered. Also, you need to uh, think about creating uh, um, kind of mobile morgues and um, refrigerated trucks and things like that. Um, and then for the transfers, uh, instead of actually transferring patients in, you need to start transferring patients out. And so for those um, patients who have non-emergent or they can wait a couple hours kind of surgeries, actually transfer them out to a, an outlying facility that has some capacity to be able to take care of those patients. So I'll leave just a couple uh, words of uh, hope and kind of crisis management. So don't lose hope, um, really be flexible and act with speed uh, because if you're waiting for a perfect plan, uh, the situation is gonna pass you by. Uh, remember your purpose and maintain a sense of community and that's what we're all doing here with Sages is trying to maintain a sense of community and learn as much as we can. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Again, I remind you to turn off your shared screen <clears throat> and our next speaker to uh, load his up. Um, You've heard from Dr. Ross, a lot goes into the planning and expanding your uh, capabilities. Um, but as you also heard, um, other uh, issues continue on like trauma care. And we are lucky to have uh, Joe Forrester from Stanford University who is a trauma surgeon, uh, but was also a field officer in Liberia during the Ebola outbreak. Uh, and he's here to talk about his experience there about how to limit some of that transmission of disease and how still to effectively take care of trauma patients when you're worried about a viral pandemic. Dr. Forrester. All right, thank you, Dr. Lim, and uh, thank you to Sages for the privilege of presenting this webinar. Now, before I jump into trauma, I wanna discuss my background as I will reference this experience throughout the rest of the talk. I was an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer from 2013 to 2015 with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For those who may not be familiar with the Epidemic Intelligence Service, or EIS, it is a government entity created in 1951 in response to perceived biologic weapons threats during the Korean War. The goal of this competitive two-year fellowship is to train disease detectives in applied and field epidemiology. During my fellowship, I was deployed to Liberia twice, from July to August, and then again from November to December in 2014 to assist the Liberian Ministry of Health with their Ebola response. 
Additionally, I participated in several domestic and international investigations into plague and tularemia outbreaks, which are two tier one bioterrorism agents. So my recommendations surrounding trauma care in a pandemic will be based upon what I learned investigating clusters of infection among healthcare workers, assisting with hospital infection preparedness during these prior outbreaks, and what we have learned so far during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there are some certainties with this novel COVID-19 pandemic. Traumatic injuries are going to continue to occur. We must maintain our capacity to respond to salvageable, traumatically injured patients. Healthcare workers must be protected as they are essential to a functioning healthcare system that cares both for infected and non-infected patients. And as resources are finite, personal protective equipment, which I abbreviate PPE for the rest of the talk, should be rationally allocated. During the rest of my talk, I'm gonna discuss tactics to help ensure that these goals are met. Now, I believe that we can safely care for trauma patients during the COVID-19 pandemic if we are able to follow four basic rules of engagement. First, all trauma patients should be assumed to have COVID-19 until proven otherwise. Second, it is the unidentified but infected COVID-19 patients that should concern you far more than the identified infected COVID-19 patients. Third, crowd control in the trauma bay is even more critical during a pandemic. And fourth, PPE worn incorrectly is just as dangerous as not wearing PPE when we are dealing with an infectious pathogen. So let's start at the beginning. All trauma patients should be presumed to have COVID-19 until proven otherwise. The first case of COVID-19 in the United States was reported at the end of January. Community transmission of COVID-19 has been documented in multiple metropolitan areas in the United States since February. This means that there is a large pool of potentially infected patients. Concerningly, some infected patients may be pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. Taken together, this means that all trauma patients should be expected to have COVID-19 until proven otherwise. And I'm defining proven here as confirmed negative by RT-PCR, but by symptom screening if RT-PCR is not available. Now, the good news is this is what we should already be doing for every trauma patient. Just as we don't know their HIV or hepatitis status, we similarly don't know their COVID status. And the other good news is that the precautions you should be taking for all trauma patients are the same as with COVID patients, with the addition of a respirator if available. Now, here you can see the CDC recommended PPE for taking care of a patient with COVID. On the left, you can see a healthcare worker with gown, gloves, face shield, and an N95. Acceptable PPE, if an N95 or higher level respirator is not available, can be seen on the right. Again, this healthcare worker is wearing gown, gloves, face shield, but a substitute of face mask for the respirator. The good news, again, is that the healthcare worker on the right is wearing what everyone in the trauma bay should be wearing anyway, irrespective of COVID. On to the second rule of engagement. It is not the identified infected COVID-19 patients, but the unidentified infected COVID-19 patients that should worry you. In Liberia and Sierra Leone, healthcare workers were four times more likely to be infected with Ebola outside of the Ebola treatment unit, abbreviated ETU, than inside. What I and others found in how healthcare workers got infected was that adherence to basic infection prevention concepts that could protect against unexpected Ebola exposure was less stringent outside of the ETU than inside. There were unrecognized but nonetheless high-risk exposures that occurred in areas after patients had been inadequately triaged and basic contact and droplet precautions were not taken as appropriate. These unrecognized exposures were amplified by overcrowding and limitations in physical space. This underscores the importance of early cohorting of infected and non-infected patients, rapid and accurate testing, and following rule number one. Now, in the graph on the right, you can see that for every healthcare worker infected in areas with known Ebola patients, there were four healthcare workers infected in areas without known Ebola patients. I suspect that a similar pattern could emerge for COVID if healthcare workers fail to adhere to basic infection prevention concepts in all of their work in the hospital, not just with the COVID patients. On to rule number three, crowd control in the trauma bay is even more critical in a pandemic. Work to minimize the number of personnel at the bedside to only those required for direct patient care. Unless trainees are required to fulfill critical roles, they should not be involved. This simple intervention will decrease the number of healthcare workers potentially exposed to an infected patient and will decrease the utilization rate of PPE. To help minimize personnel, I recommend posting guidelines explicitly stating the minimum number of team members. You can see the graphic that we, that we created at our institution on the right, which we posted outside of each trauma bay. Finally, empower your nurse leaders and trauma captains to act as infection prevention oversight to strictly enforce your institutional guidelines.
Now, once patient care begins, healthcare workers should not exit the trauma bay in PPE unless transporting a patient. This will decrease opportunities for healthcare workers wearing PPE to act as fomites and transmit virus unintentionally to areas outside of the trauma bay. This will also decrease the utilization rate of PPE as healthcare workers will be less likely to don and doff multiple times. For those who may not be familiar with the terminology, donning is putting on PPE, doffing is taking off PPE. Trauma medical director and nurse leader audits help to ensure compliance with crowd control. So under rule four, PPE worn incorrectly is just as dangerous as not having PPE. In blinded video assessments, correct PPE donning occurs in only about one third of unsupervised encounters. And concerningly, about one third of donning errors will lead to unintentional direct patient provider contact, which is an opportunity for infection. And irrespective of whether PPE was put on correctly or not, PPE use can lead to a false sense of security among healthcare workers, which may also increase exposure. Now, given this risk of unidentified transmission with PPE worn incorrectly and known community transmission, it is essential that everyone in the trauma bay should be appropriately donned in PPE. Having an ED nurse leader and trauma medical director, again, perform trauma audits helps with compliance. And I can tell you, if we could don PPE in rural Liberia safely in tropical heat and humidity, then we can also don PPE correctly in the trauma bay here in the States. It just takes attention to detail and a shared team vision for healthcare worker protection. Healthcare workers can also be exposed to virus if PPE is improperly doffed. Around 40% of doffing misadventures result in self-contamination. Common areas of contamination include the neck, hands, fingers, arms, wrists, and face. To protect against self-contamination, PPE must be doffed in the correct sequence. Doffing is also time intensive uh, when done correctly. So to assist trauma team members with safe doffing, a doffing buddy or doffing supervisor should be present at the trauma bay. I'd like to finish by describing a suggested workflow for managing traumatically injured patients during a pandemic. This workflow accounts for the potential for infected but unidentified patients and the need to address immediately life-threatening injuries. Symptom triage should begin in the pre-hospital setting. When the patient arrives to the trauma bay, a patient should be masked if not already done. Healthcare workers donned in appropriate PPE should care for the trauma patient as they normally would, but also symptom screen the patient as soon as possible. In the event that a patient requires an emergency intervention and is unable to be tested or symptom screened, the emergency intervention should occur as if the patient were COVID-19 positive. If patients are stable, they should undergo rapid testing and cohorting with either other infected or non-infected patients, respectively. Or if testing is unavailable, then patients should be symptom screened and cohorted accordingly. So my goal has been to provide you information on how to safely care for trauma patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I think you can do so by following these four important rules. All patients should be assumed to have COVID-19 until proven otherwise. Unidentified but infected patients should concern you more than the identified infected patients. Crowd control in the trauma bay is even more critical during a pandemic and PPE worn incorrectly is just as dangerous as no PPE. I would like to, uh, to end with what I think is some good news. Santa Clara County, uh, California, which is where I practice, was one of the first areas of the country to have a mandatory shelter in place order enforced. As a result of the shelter in place, we notice an almost immediate drop in trauma volume. The upper graph shows our county trauma volume in 2018 and 2019 from January to March. In the graph below, you can see our trauma volume in 2020 during the same months. The cardinal star is the day our shelter in place order went into effect. While it is not clear to what degree this trend will hold true across the country, it is reassuring to see that there is at least some positive effect from the pandemic. And with that, again, I would like to thank Dr. Lemon Sages for the opportunity to present, and I would be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Forrester. I appreciate that. Uh, excellent talk. Um, you can see uh, we're trying to transition down from uh, a system-wide approach to a hospital approach and then to a uh, you know, a, a, a certain specialty approach, in this case, trauma. We're going to continue to focus down a little bit <clears throat> as I introduce uh, our next speaker while he's uh, starting to share his screen. Um, this is uh, Dr. Chris Michetti, uh, who is chair of the Critical Care Committee of the AAST. His committee has uh, just today uh, published our recommendations on the timing and technique for tracheostomy uh, in COVID-19 positive or COVID-19 suspected patients. Um, I'd like to also recognize Clay Kaufman-Berlou. She and I have been uh, working together for several years now, 
combining uh, our educational resources between SAGES and AAST. Uh, and she is uh, inherently responsible for a lot of information that's being passed to you tonight. Uh, so with that, uh, Dr. Machetti, there you go. I think we're all set. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Hope you can hear me okay. Well, uh, hello everyone. Thank you uh, to SAGES for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about tracheostomy uh, as well as the AAST recommendations that came out just today. So in this uh, brief time, I'm going to talk about the timing of tracheostomy during the COVID pandemic, especially about provider safety during the procedure and review some techniques of tracheostomy, particularly in these patients. And the disclaimer here is really that there's no direct evidence about all of these things. This is an area where evidence is evolving and our recommendations are extrapolated from data on airborne infection transmission, expert opinion, and what's going on in the current context of the pandemic. But these things may change as new data emerge and any recommendations here would have to be uh, adopted and adapted to your local environment. So this is our paper that came out today about performing tracheostomy. And this is a collaboration between the Critical Care Committee and the Acute Care Surgery Committee of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma. And you can see the link there and that will be available. This is an open access journal, so anyone can go and download it today. During my talk, if you see an asterisk, that's gonna denote something that was referenced specifically in this paper. So severe disease in COVID is occurring in about 5% of those who are infected. And according to the CDC, the median hospital stay is about 10 to 13 days for these patients. In the US, about a quarter of patients are admitted to an ICU. And in Wuhan, China, about the same. And in Wuhan, about 47% of the patients in the ICU were on a mechanical ventilator. And one question that would be important to answer is what's the duration of mechanical ventilation in the average patient? But we don't really know that yet. We only have anecdotal data. Early in the US pandemic, it was thought that ventilator scarcity was going to be a big issue, which it is in some areas, and that the best way to recirculate these ventilators back toward uh, other patients is to try to liberate patients from the ventilator as soon as possible. And tracheostomy started to be discussed as a potential method to do this with the theory that maybe those patients would spend less time on the ventilator. Um, as the pandemic evolved, most people realized that uh, COVID patients were not dying specifically from complications of prolonged mechanical ventilation. And those patients that were on the vent for a long time were either too sick or unstable to undergo a trach, improving enough to be extubated in the normal fashion or were subsequently tested negative. So when we think about the benefits of tracheostomy in the non-COVID population, in the general critical care population, there are potential benefits of reduced duration of mechanical ventilation and ICU length of stay and possibly ventilator associated pneumonia in traumatic brain injury patients. In COVID-19 patients, we really have no good data to say anything about the effect of tracheostomy on any of these outcomes. So one thing to note is the risk to providers during this procedure, since tracheostomy is a highly aerosol generating procedure with a significant risk of viral transmission if the provider is not properly protected. One systematic review gave an odds ratio of 4.2 for viral transmission with a trach, which was second among aerosol generating procedures only to intubation. However, that review was done in 2012 before the routine use of video laryngoscopy. So in our estimation, trach as it's done uh, currently is likely much more aerosol generating than intubation uh, in COVID patients. In the SARS epidemic in Toronto and currently in Wuhan, there was a high rate of healthcare worker infection from in-hospital exposure. And so infection present prevention for healthcare personnel is essential and a high priority, especially in the pandemic when we need our healthcare workers at work. Also, you have to think about what will happen to the patient who undergoes tracheostomy with COVID after the procedure. If this patient is weaned to trach collar, they'll have frequent coughing, will need frequent suctioning, and are often spreading secretions on their neck and chest. You wouldn't really be able to use humidified T piece, which is the very definition of aerosolization. And so possibly caring for patients off the ventilator with a trach may be in fact riskier to healthcare workers than caring for intubated patients with COVID. So this may offset the theoretical benefits of early trach in these populations. Trach we know has poor long-term outcomes in non-surgical patients with a high one-year mortality 
And early in the disease with COVID, the viral loads are very high. So we really would discourage early trach in this population. And overall, it would be rarely indicated in COVID-19 patients in general, especially if you're in an environment that has rapid testing available and you're not doing ventilator triage where you really have to do the high level triage to give a vent to one person and not to another in those crisis situations that were mentioned in other talks. So on the AAST document, we recommend two strategies, delayed tracheostomy or not performing tracheostomy. If you're delaying the procedure, you can wait until testing is negative for COVID and the patient meets the CDC criteria for removing airborne isolation precautions, which is basically two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. Otherwise, don't perform the tracheostomy and continue standard weaning until extubation. And the AAST is not the only group recommending this. There are many other organizations as published here, as you can see, and uh, including otolaryngology associations from the US, from Canada, and from the UK who are all recommending avoiding or delaying trach in COVID positive patients if possible. So now I wanna get into some procedural safety. If you are really doing a procedure on a known or suspected COVID positive patient, First, it's recommended to use a negative pressure airborne infection isolation room uh, for maximal protection. If this is unavailable, then ten, we should uh, try to avoid room entry except by essential personnel for at least three hours after the procedure because the virus may be aerosolized for that long. We recommend using only essential personnel and the most experienced personnel, both to do the quickest uh, procedure and decrease risk to those in the room and to not have any, anyone in the room for exposure if they don't really have to be there. And using a runner outside the room would help get equipment that's needed and allow the provider to really only enter the room once. A HEPA viral filter uh, can be used on the ventilator and suctioning equipment for viral filtration. And in the COVID uh, patient, neuromuscular blockade is really strongly encouraged to prevent any coughing whatsoever, which would cause aerosolization. And you can also consider glycopyrrolate before the procedure to decrease oral and tracheal secretions. And of course, double gowning and gloving will provide protection if donned and doffed properly. A PAPR, a powered air purifying respirator, is recommended with an N95 mask underneath as a backup. Of course, we understand that not every hospital or environment would have PAPRs available, but if available, it's recommended to use. The assigned protection factor of a PAPR is 25 versus 10 for an N95 mask. And the CDC also says that not using a PAPR during an aerosol generating procedure upgrades the risk to the provider from low to medium. You also wanna fully dr double drape the bed to avoid any soak through and use a cuff, non-fenestrated tracheostomy tube to avoid any air leakage. So now for some technical considerations during the procedure, avoid using electrosurgical energy to prevent any virus uh, aerosolizing in the air. And here's where the technique really differs from the standard tracheostomy. In order to prevent uh, any air leakage, stop ventilation after an exhalation prior to entering the trachea. And for an open technique, that means prior to incising the trachea. And for percutaneous, that means after placing the wire and prior to dilating the trachea. Resume ventilation only after the trach tube is placed and the cuff is inflated to have no air leakage outside the contained circuit. Also remove the endotracheal tube from the mouth directly into a plastic bag after the procedure. A word about bronchoscopy, which is routinely used for a lot of people for percutaneous trach. Um, you have to, we would uh, consider omitting bronchoscopy from this procedure because it's an aerosol generating procedure in and of itself and it adds another person in the room. And you do have to consider your local environment, of course, your surgeon's experience, the patient's anatomy, and the physiology when deciding to do this. Um, disposable bronchoscopes are recommended if you have them, so you don't have to worry about the cleaning issues. And if you're not gonna use a bronch, there are several techniques you can do to localize the area and make sure the endotracheal tube is high enough. One is digital palpation to sense the uh, change in firmness of the trachea as the ET tube is pulled back above your site. Another is using a Doppler directly on the trach through your incision to hear the uh, audible volume of the ventilation as the endotracheal tube gets higher above your site. And the other is a water-filled needle 
to demonstrate the aspirational bubbles so you know you're in the tracheal lumen. So overall recommendations, if you have a patient who is never a person under investigation or they were a PUI and tested negative, you can probably do this procedure safely with the standard technique, but out of an abundance of caution, it's, uh, it should be considered to use a negative pressure room and the N95 mask with full fluid shield. For a COVID-19 positive patient, the mo most precautions you have uh, that, that would be better using a negative pressure room, full PPE, including a PAPR and N95 with the most experienced personnel and with the modified technique that I described. And for a COVID-19 patient that was previously positive but now tested negative, mostly we would recommend doing this in the same fashion as if they were positive, unless you were very uh, sure that your testing had a very low false negative rate. So that concludes my part of the talk and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bacchetti. I know you're on call today, so I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Hopefully you won't get called away. Um, and again, just to review, we've gone from a systems approach uh, and I'm done, done to a procedure level. Uh, but the other aspect of this is uh, basically getting out of your comfort zone uh, as a clinician. And uh, we are fortunate today to have two people who have done just that, Dr. Pat Silla, who's a colorectal surgeon uh, in New York City, and also chair of the SAGES Colorectal Task Force. Uh, we also have Dan Heron, who's co-chair of the SAGES Technology Council, normally a bariatric surgeon. Uh, both have been uh, uprooted from their normal daily lives and asked to uh, uh, do work um, in the ICU and the ER of respective hospitals. Uh, so here to tell them about that personal experience uh, are Drs. Heron and Dr. Silla. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to start this talk, uh, but I want to thank you um, and Horacio for thinking of us and letting us uh, share some of our insight and experience. This has been a very a difficult couple of weeks and the past two weeks we've been pulled in and uh, we're here to share our experience and hopefully um, you will be able to benefit from our tips if you get pulled in to the front line. So you all know what's going on in the news. I mean this is being blasted uh, every couple of minutes. Um, we are the epicenter of the epidemic uh, pretty much around the world. Uh, we've been hit like a storm. Um, it's been absolutely incredible. We've lived through the surge. Uh, the good news is that we're starting to plateau off, so um, this is really exciting. The number of hospitalization across the city and New York State is, is leveraged off, and um, uh, we're starting to really see some progress. And the impact of the New York pause or the social distancing uh, policy by our governor, who has been very aggressive from day one, um, is really starting to pay off. So uh, the level of the hospital, this is just to show you how we've responded, uh, not just at our hospital, which is Mount Sinai Health System, which consists in eight different hospitals, but really across all of New York City hospitals. You'll see this will be very similar for them as well. But as you started to see more cases coming in, uh, the first step, of, as we described earlier, was really to expand the ICU capacity. So that was really the focus of the hospital administration was to really expand ICU capacity. And then what you saw is pretty much mid-March, uh, we already uh, put into effect our no visitor policy, as we talked about, as a, a very good strategy. And we also stopped all elective surgery, but we were still allowed to, to proceed with cancer surgery. So as we talked about, uh, we were not at level condition zero. We were really were at pretty much level, uh, level two going on to level one. And then we continue to expand our capacity in terms of ICU and non-ICU space. And then finally, uh, our program director, Dr. Davina, was very aggressive also in preparing the surgical residency uh, for, this, uh, for this pandemic. And so very early on, she started staggering PGY rotation schedule and making sure that not everybody, as we talked about, was deployed at the same time to really protect the residents and reduce the risk of exposure. Um, we stopped urgent surgery uh, pretty much a week later. And then you can see um, our surgical team started to prepare for deployment um, just a few weeks ago, just three weeks ago. And the first run of deployment occurred uh, on the 29th. So pretty much uh, two, two weeks, uh, we're going on to 16, 17 days of deployment for some of us. Um, in terms of, of a, a space capacity, you'll see that besides the ICUs, we had to also create very quickly some space to be able to put uh, less acute patients. And you can see all those tents that were developed outside the hospital, but also within the hospital. This is actually our lobby where normally there's a nice open space and a Starbucks has been essentially taken over by those tents that are equipped with oxygen and suction and all the materials that are required for non-intubated uh, stable patients that are awaiting discharge home. <clears throat> 
Um, this is also happening right outside our hospitals, right on Central Park. So Merton Purse and Mount Sinai have established a collaboration where they also are accepting up to 68 COVID positive patients. And that also has really been helpful uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to make some capacity for patients uh, who are on the verge of being discharged, but not quite stable enough to be discharged. This is really has been a huge effort, as you know, nationally also to make um, more room and create more capacity. We had the USNS Comfort uh, with a thousand bed capacity. And then just today we heard that the Javits Center already has 800 beds occupied out of a capacity of 2,500 beds for COVID patients. So it's really been a massive co co cohesive uh, a targeted approach to really create capacity to be able to deal with the surge that we've, ex we've been experiencing in New York City. And I'll pass this to Dan in terms of uh, how we all have been prepared uh, to enter deployment. Dan? Uh, that's great. Thanks, Pat. And also, thanks, Rob and Horacio, for putting together such a great uh, program, a great panel tonight. Um, this is kind of the good news and the bad news that you see on the graph. And the bad news is that the numbers are pretty high. Um, if you look at our numbers at Mount Sinai, which is a health system with eight hospitals, as of about two days ago, uh, we had 1,962 patients uh, with COVID in our system. Uh, another 127 patients under investigation. And if you just look at the number of patients in our ICUs, it was uh, 452 patients. So it's a, a large number. That's the bad news. The good news is that you can see things really are leveling off. And it's not leveling off because we've maxed out the capacity of our hospital uh, because those overflow areas that uh, Pat was showing you, that area outside our Starbucks, uh, which is now converted to a nursing station and the, our, our atrium, which is now converted to uh, a COVID unit, uh, those beds are still empty, I'm happy to say. So we still have a fair amount of overflow capacity and this leveling off is not uh, caused by a saturation. Um, next slide. So our Department of Surgery has stopped doing elective cases. We're still doing emergency cases, although interestingly, we've seen that many of the typical cases that were commonly expecting like uh, gallbladders and appendixes and trauma cases have tremendously uh, decreased in numbers. Um, so we're seeing uh, uh, no elective surgery and a, and a tremendous decrease in our urgent surgery. Um, so all of our surgeons have been uh, redeployed from their normal surgical teams into, uh, you know, essentially task forces. And these, uh, these teams are made up of anywhere from one to five members. Um, the requests for these teams come from uh, the upper level management of our hospital and gets relayed to the various department chairs. In the Department of Surgery, um, our vice chair, uh, who is typically in command of the economic side of our, uh, of our department, is now uh, in command of our uh, allocation of personnel. Uh, so she is responsible for uh, uh, allocating people. I think we uh, lost our slide there, Pat. Can we go back to the... Uh, slide we were on before. Excellent. Um, so typically, uh, there we go. Yeah. So what do the teams consist of? Well, they're variable and they depend on the task that the teams are going to get assigned to. I was initially on a team with two attending surgeons, myself and a vascular surgeon, a surgical fellow, uh, a, uh, uh, a nurse practitioner, and a couple of medical assistants. So you really have the, a very uh, diverse range of training and experiences uh, but everyone is able to help in these situations. We've also created a bunch of specialized teams which are focused not so much on just diving into a, a floor or an ICU situation, but uh, teams that are focused on placing lines, uh, peritoneal dialysis catheters, because our hemodialysis uh, system has really been overwhelmed. Um, teams which are skilled at proning patients because that's become much more common now than it's ever been in the past and also teams for performing tracheostomy, and that's typically percutaneous uh, tracheostomy. Pat, could we go to the next slide? So in terms of preparation, uh, our surgeons got very nervous. Uh, as, as you heard before, I'm a minimally invasive surgeon with a focus in bariatric surgery. So what do I know about treating infectious disease and donning and doffing and and managing, uh, and managing critically ill patients who are intubated and on a number of different pressors and all that. Well, uh, we prepared quite rapidly by doing a bunch of online training modules. Uh, most of the standard stuff that, that, that I'm sure everyone in this audience has already seen, how to put your uh, PPE on, take it off, best practices, uh, basics of critical care, ventilator management, 
and then reading through all the COVID-19 treatment guidelines and protocols, which of course are changing on a daily basis. Uh, that being said, that's a lot of uh, theory, which once you're in the trenches becomes uh, uh, variably uh, applicable, uh, would be the polite way to describe it. Um, in terms of team prep, you have to make sure that before your team gets dropped off into a ICU or emergency room or a COVID unit or floor, uh, you need to make sure that uh, the PPE supplies are available. So they may be provided by the hospital, uh, but they may be provided by your department and that you might bring them with you to make sure that you have backup supplies if necessary. Um, there are some very simple things that, that we made sure to have, things like Ziploc bags to put your phone in because your phone is gonna be used all the time for communication and texting. We were using WhatsApp as our uh, major app for uh, communication in our team. Uh, so everyone keeps their bag in a Ziploc phone uh, to keep it from getting contaminated. Um, in terms of uh, role assignment, again, you have the, the key word is flexibility because you have uh, teams of people of very different training and very different uh, knowledge bases who are all working together in a very tough situation. Uh, and uh, you even have to think about things like transportation. Uh, we were deployed, I'm used to working at Mount Sinai Hospital, which is uh, an 1100 bed hospital in the middle of Manhattan, but I was deployed to Mount Sinai Brooklyn, which is one of our small sister hospitals. It's a 200 bed community hospital uh, in, a, in a working class area in Brooklyn, uh, where I really, I visited once or twice uh, for administrative purposes, but I'd never actually uh, been to a patient room there. So it was a little bit of an eye opener for me as well. Uh, next slide, Pat. Um, so uh, here, this is a picture that I took uh, today. That's my, my fellow, Dr. Ben Schwab, who is, he signed up to have a laparoscopic and minimally invasive robotic fellowship. And here he is serving as a COVID uh, unit physician. Uh, and you can see this is uh, pretty much what we're wearing. Uh, we were uh, happy to receive some donations of uh, ripstop nylon uh, gowns, which uh, it's that dark green gown, which you can see underneath the yellow gown. So he's wearing that dark green gown underneath, and we put that on on top of our scrubs before we uh, walk into the hospital. Make sure you wear comfortable shoes because you are on your feet nonstop for the, for the shift if you're working in a COVID unit. Um, little things like, uh, where are you going to park? I was in a hospital where I didn't have any parking uh, lot or anything like that, but they were generous in that neighborhood to allow parking and no parking zones if you put a copy of your doctor's ID on the dashboard of your car. Um, so over this uh, green suit that we're wearing, you can see we put on a yellow cover gown. Uh, we typically keep one pair of gloves on our hands nonstop pretty much for most of the day. And then uh, we treat that as our, as our, our, our second skin or our, our, our hands. And then we put gloves on top of that. And we will often wash our gloves with the uh, with uh, soap as we would our hands uh, if, if it were a different situation. Um, we don't even enter the hospital before we have an N95 mask on and we put a cover mask on top of our N95 uh, so that we don't get splattering uh, on that and hopefully we can get more than one use out of the N95 either through reusing on our own or uh, recycling through a formal recycling program. And then everyone has a face shield um, and uh, uh, gloves on top of your gloves and shoe covers. Um, how do you do things like, uh, where do you keep your pens? Well, you don't want to put your pens uh, uh, in, in your pants pocket or in a vest pocket because you have no vest pocket. So typically we just clip them right onto the tie around the waist of your gown and uh, be sure when you take all this stuff off that it's going in a safe place. Um, when I get home, uh, I wear my scrubs uh, back home, but then the first thing I do is I run to the bathroom and I <laughs> throw all my contaminated clothes into a garbage bag uh, and take a shower uh, and I try and uh, treat it like a very contaminated trash. Uh, I normally have a beard. Uh, that was not gonna fly for an N95 mask. So I, I had to shave off my beard. Uh, I see that uh, doc, Dr. Asbrin has a very nicely trimmed beard there, but I, even if you do have a nicely trimmed goatee, you need to make sure that uh, it will fit under the edges of, a go, uh, of, of an N95. So make sure uh, if you do have facial hair that it is trimmed appropriately so that you're gonna get a very solid seal around the entire respirator mask. Um, and uh, another issue is uh, simple things like name tags. Everybody looks the same in a COVID unit because everyone has the same yellow gown on. So typically people are writing their name uh, on a little uh, white sticker and sticking that to the top of their visor or you can write your name directly on your gown. Uh, a bunch of Israeli 
doctors came up with a great idea of putting a picture of themselves uh, on the front of their bunny suits so that the patients would know what they looked like underneath their outfits. We didn't get that fancy. And in terms of expected tasks, again, uh, it's nice to have you know, an acute care surgery team and it's nice to, nice to have your uh, intensivists, but realistically, all of us who went through a surgical training program uh, spent some time working in critical care training. And so uh, you, if you look at some of the pictures uh, of, of Mount Sinai, you're gonna see people like me, I'm a bariatric surgeon and here I am managing uh, drips and, and, and vent settings and all that. We have plastic surgeons, we have people who for, you know, who had not worked in an intensive care unit for many years, uh, being thrust right into a medical intensive care unit focusing on COVID. Uh, but flexibility is really the key issue. Uh, my first assignment was to work in the emergency room at, uh, at Mount Sinai, Brooklyn. And in the emergency room, we were filled way, way, way beyond capacity. I mean, this is a very small community hospital. Emergency room typically has about 20 patients in it, and it was seeing about double that number uh, with you know, anywhere from 10, 15, sometimes 20 patients uh, intubated and on portable ventilators uh, in, the, in the emergency room. So really, the emergency room was functioning much more like an intensive care unit, and the emergency docs were completely overwhelmed. So my initial assignment was to go in to basically be deployed right into the emergency room. Uh, it was myself, another attending, a fellow, a nurse practitioner, and two medical assistants, uh, basically to see what the need was. We had no clear assignment at that time, and, and uh, we were told to see what needs to be done and help out. And very quickly, we realized that there were two issues in this particular emergency room. One was managing these critical care patients. The ER docs are fantastic at stabilizing patients and making quick diagnoses and getting patients intubated and running codes. They're not so focused on taking care of that patient once they're intubated, once they're placed on their epinephrine or their levofed drip and, and they're gonna be sitting there for 12 or 24 or 36 hours, which is how long it was taking us to get these patients uh, transferred to an intensive care unit or another hospital. So, uh, so one of the attendings in our group, and typically that would be me, uh, took over the management of these critically, care, uh, critically ill intensive care patients. And it was just very basic stuff, uh, sending the blood gases, managing their vents, and uh, titrating their drips based on uh, whatever information you had. And the other attending took over the job of managing the transfers. You had to get the patients out of the emergency room, up to the floor, up to the intensive care units, uh, and hopefully to other hospitals that were still accepting patients. Uh, so uh, that was what was needed uh, in the initial surge of patients, and, and that's what we did. But everyone was doing everything, and, and the flexibility and the need to adapt, uh, you know, we, we, we've heard about that. You know, Michael was talking about the importance of being adaptive, and, and how many times did he say this is not business as usual? Uh, that is absolutely true. And I think that uh, I was doing things like, uh, I, I was transporting uh, intubated and ventilated patients uh, because there were, there was, there were two uh, respiratory therapists in this hospital of 200 beds. Uh, and essentially all 200 beds in this hospital were COVID patients. So uh, when you needed to get a patient, you know, if you called for respiratory therapy, no one would answer their pager because they were too tied up with uh, more important work. So ultimately you had surgeons and medical assistants transporting intubated patients from the emergency room up to the intensive care unit and doing the best job that we had. So we were learning about things like uh, not just, you know, how to order a vent setting, but how to, you know, how to, uh, how to actually change the vent settings yourself, how to take someone who is ventilated and get them onto a uh, an AMBU bag if necessary to get them upstairs and doing our best, of course, to use the appropriate filters to minimize the spread of aerosolized particles. So uh, I, I can say that it was an extremely stressful experience. It's also an incredible learning experience. Um, uh, and uh, certainly um, uh, it was not only a learning experience for myself, but for the fellows and for the medical assistants. Uh, next slide. I think it was very also important to emphasize that, so besides the emergency room, the CQ is more organized um, and you will be asked and expected to do things like an intern. I mean, we'll have to be honest. Uh, you're supporting the team there. You're helping with rounds, notes, transfers we talked about, and especially spending a lot of time talking to families and updating them. Typically, we update families two to three times a day based on how, what the events of the day are, obviously. And, and this is the only way for many patients of communicating with families. So this is an, an important part of what you do as well. 
And on the floor, you know, what you don't realize is that the nurses are rounding on patients and collecting vitals every, every eight hours on the floor I'm on right now. And so you really need to take control and get a handle on weaning patients safely. And it becomes, you know, what we call oxygen rounds. You essentially come in the room several times every hour to check on patients who are still on BiPAP and trying to get them off onto high flow oxygen um, and then non-rebreather face mask and ultimately to nasal cannula. So this is the kind of tasks that you will be asked for because you really need to support the team in, 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 in helping those patients survive um, their, their episodes. We also have to talk about frequency of deployment. That's a common question. Right now in New York, and I talk to facilities across the entire city, the deployment schedule is similar. Uh, it's really uh, eight to 12 hour shifts. Uh, usually you get on for three days and you're off for then two to three days after. And um, this is really important because you need to pace yourself. There's no question that there's some issues with fatigue that we'll talk about, uh, but the schedule changes really rapidly and locations also. So uh, on occasion, Dan and I will get called at seven or eight o'clock PM that night to get your assignment for the following day for the following three days. So it's, it's disruptive, but almost like a, you know, a trauma call, you have to be prepared uh, to be deployed uh, at any given location. Another important principle when you work in a team, especially with people who are less experienced than yourself, is to really minimize team member exposure. So we tend to try to round on patients and see patients together, but you really want to assign one person on the team to go and actually see the patient. And because there's always a risk of exposure to all the members of the team, so you want to minimize the amount of, of procedures, you want to get all the information from the patient at one time to minimize the entire team being exposed, especially in a high risk patient. Uh, mental and physical fatigue is really important. You need to really monitor not just yourself, but your teams, especially your more uh, inexperienced junior members of the team, you have to really keep a keen eye on fatigue because fatigue will translate in not only, not only adverse events and errors in medication or orders, but it will make you more sloppy uh, when, especially during codes. Uh, you find that at the end of the shift and when there's a, there's a code, and you'll find that some of the members of the team will not even have their face shield completely covering themselves uh, or will perform chest compression on having a full protection on their face. So you have to be very alert and really monitor. We have to monitor each other to make sure that we're fully protected because that's really number one. And I think it's really important to know bad things will happen. You will watch people die. Um, we had a 38 year old patient who died yesterday um, coming from the emergency room. This will happen and, and you have to remember that this is not your fault. Um, and so there's a lot of processing that really um, needs to happen. Dan and mentioned this, rank doesn't matter. As I said, you'll be functioning like an intern. Everybody pitches in and does everything. You have really have to help and get into that mode uh, to really be able to, uh, to pull through together. Uh, it's important to delegate tasks. As I said, not, don't send three people to see a patient, really divide and conquer. And you get into a rhythm eventually, uh, you become really effective and efficient. And that's what we do, that we're surgeons. We, we know how to organize and start becoming highly functional as a team. And that's exactly what it is, just a different environment. Um, finally, we want to emphasize the briefing. I think it's really important. It was very important to me um, after seeing patients die on my watch. Uh, you need to process, you know, what, what could have happened differently, uh, any near misses, anything that you could have done better, especially when it comes to PPE. We ask each other to check ourselves. Uh, it's really important to process, as I said, and, and there were any troubleshooting issues. You know, we had problems with oxygen saturators that were not working. We could not get some, some equipment that we really needed. I couldn't get people on telemetry when I was really worried. And you need to resolve that, that these issues before you move on to the next patient and before you move on to the next shift. It's really important to process, otherwise you carry anger and frustration against the system and you take that home and it's, it's, it's a really um, destructive process. So you need to have a discussion and a powwow, a, a huddle with, with, a, with a, the nurse manager or the ED attending to really make sure that this doesn't happen again. I find it very comforting to have this type of debrief sessions with a critical care and intensivist because obviously they have the most experience and the most insight and they'll be able to really uh, help you uh, digest and, and get prepared for the next patient and understand why was this patient particularly sick? What did the inflammatory markers tell you about the, patient, the patients and the potential for them to crash faster than others? So you really pick up a lot of that judgment, gut feeling, uh, impression, because as you know, these patients will crash and a lot of times one x-ray looks exactly the same as the other or they're the exact same age, but one will crash one and the other and so you need to get that finesse that that the clinical judgment that intuition that we don't have uh, to really know which patients you need to really keep a close eye on and then you pick that up very very quickly but you need to be really alert and and, and be prepared to learn um, duration of deployment how long are we going to be on the field Dan has been on the field for longer than all of us he's been you know deployed twice already there's no clear end on site we have not heard uh, from our leaders when this is going to end uh, so it, you have to maintain team morale. Um, people get depressed. Uh, the most important thing to know is that a lot of us, including myself, are separating from families to avoid um, family infection. Uh, 
I haven't seen my kids um, in 10 days. Um, you know, I'm used to traveling and be separated, but this is different uh, because, you know, it's, you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know how long is going to be uh, going on. So it's, it's, it's difficult um, to, uh, to, to live through this uh, as a mother, as a father, and, and you have to really prepare yourself for this. Uh, it helps to talk about it. You know, Horacio checked on me a couple of days ago because he knew I was down. Um, and so did Rob. I mean, these, these kind of interaction and, and, and checking on each other is really, really important. Um, you don't want to be alone for too long when you get home processing all of that information. Seeking advice, again, growing from these experiences and be prepared. It will toughen you up for the next cases, for your next shift. Uh, it will build resilience and, and it's really helpful. And then finally, you need to care for yourself when you're at home. Uh, whether it's a workout or cooking or knitting or, you know, being on Zoom as much as possible for work or just conversation is really important. I don't have pets, but Dan can speak of, of the therapeutic effect of having pets. Um, Dana Sands is a friend of mine who's a colorectal surgeon in Cleveland Clinic, Florida. I asked her to start a nightly exercise routine for those of us who just don't know how to exercise. <laughs> she's been amazing. And every night, religiously, she's actually online right now for Facebook. She does a 20-minute exercise for us. Uh, we're not avid work workouts uh, uh, people, but really to keep us engaged and keep us moving uh, so that we can really digest for all this thing. And you can see here, these are my kids making drawings and, and, um, and trying to keep me a beat as well. So um, whatever it takes, uh, you need to, uh, to stay in the game and, and, um, and keep your head up and know that eventually this is going to all hopefully go back to some semi-normal and that will keep you going uh, strong. On a positive note, this was my uh, chief resident last week on the step down unit, Loic, and Loic welcomed his first baby boy uh, yesterday. Um, so uh, his son Noah was born uh, very healthy and very happy. And Loic actually um, um, has been amazing through all of this. And as I said, you, you see people rise up and our chief residents um, become mini heroes and captains of the, sh of the ship. And they really kind of take us around and, and get us through these experiences as well. So it's been really impressive to see the residents really rise up to the occasion. Um, I'm going to turn this to Ed and stop sharing. And this is uh, just a video to show you uh, what at seven o'clock every night, the ritual that New Yorkers go through to support us. And that's another uh, amazing uh, thing to, to know that our efforts are not going unnoticed. New York has really rallied to support us and um, they know what we're going through. And it's Thank you very much. Uh, that ends the the, the uh, talks of the by PowerPoint. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, we're gonna I'm gonna line up some questions for the panel uh, that have been coming through. But first question I have uh, for is for Pat and Dan, who are out there. I see a couple of questions. I think you told me yesterday, uh, Dr. Silla, that there's still about a hundred people a day dying in New York City. Is that is that correct still? Well, within the Dan can, can attest to it. I mean, I can't speak to the numbers across so New York State. We're still at 700 to 800 deaths per day. Uh, the number has not plateaued off. Um, New York City is a little less, but you can imagine each hospital is, um, is still seeing days where we see 50 to 80 patients die. So yeah. we're, not, we're not out of the woods in terms of mortality. And then Dan, uh, I know you mentioned a lot of tips and, and uh, tricks for going and working in a different what is the one thing that you can say was probably the, you wish you had done uh, a week before you, you started working on one of these shifts? Um, that's a great question. And there is no one thing because every situation you're gonna get dropped into is different. Then I was, I was put into the ER at Mount Sinai, Brooklyn, which is a very particular situation for two weeks. And then after that, uh, uh, right now, I'm currently deployed at the medical intensive care unit there. Uh, which in comparison is a very civilized experience. It's much more like what we're used to as surgeons. Um, so um, when I was in the ER, I was talking a little bit about what I was doing there. In the, in the medical ICU, I'm, uh, they're happy to have a surgeon there. So I'm doing things like putting in lines, uh, you know, doing a lot of intern work, uh, drawing blood gases, actually running the blood. You know, it, I can't tell you, it's been probably about 25 years since I've taken a blood gas and actually put it on an ABG machine and typed in the patient's information and, and got it on the computer. So 
Um, really, I'm, I'm working as a combination of uh, intern, respiratory therapist, uh, line placement physician, uh, and uh, intensive care nurse. That's pretty much what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of doing things, you know, the, the, the level, they've kind of relaxed the level of uh, um, uh, documentation needed for a lot of these things. So yes, if you're putting in a central line, you'll write a note for it. But a lot of the other things that you might uh, ordinarily put in orders for or write orders for or write notes about, you know, if you walk up to a patient and change their drip, you might just like yell it over to the nurse and change the leave of that or change the vent setting and come back a few minutes later and see how they're doing. So there's a lot, a lot of kind of battlefield mentality. I'm not saying if that's good or bad, but it's kind of the necessary thing. If your question is, how could I have prepared for this? Is there something that I could have known in advance? Um, the answer is no. Uh, just go into it with an open mind and know that uh, the answers to most of your questions can be found on Google, including, you know, what are all these new ventilator modes that didn't exist uh, back when I was in training? Uh, so I, I've been doing a lot of uh, learning between seeing patients. All right. Well, thank you very much. Really incredible work that you guys are doing. And, uh, and do stay safe and do... Uh, look on each other, uh, making sure you guys are staying healthy. Uh, the first question is going to direct towards Dr. Machetti and Dr. Berlou. The questions came from the audience is, uh, what is the right time to do a trach? Is it two weeks, is it three weeks? And then how long would you delay doing a tracheostomy for a patient that's on the ventilator? Well, um, I can tell you, uh, you, when we discussed this uh, among our committees, we didn't come up with a time length. Um, it really depended on the patient's COVID status. And so I can imagine you might be in a situation where a patient's on the ventilator for between two and three weeks where they're still testing positive and you might have to make a decision at that point. But really, unless your resources are incredibly strained and getting that patient off the ventilator sooner, a few days sooner will be a major benefit um, you know, you should really test them and make sure they're negative and not transmissible at that time. Agree. We really don't have, you know, anything other than anecdotal reports as we talk amongst surgeons across the country. But I think somewhere between the two and three, year, three week mark is where most of us are making that decision. Also, we recently did a tracheostomy in someone who was starting to have oral ulcerations and oropharyngeal complications related to a prolonged intubation. So sometimes those local factors also can play a role in that decision making. Okay, thank you. The next question will be to Dr. Forrester, uh, but anyone who can answer who's actually been in the thick of things. But Dr. Forrester, the question is, um, what is the rate of clinical staff getting the virus during the work at the hospital? And which areas of the hospital do you think are the most susceptible to getting contaminated? We'll have Dr. Forster first and then Drs. Uh, Solo and Heron. Um, yeah, I guess I would defer this to the folks who are in New York, but um, I would think that the people in the ED um, yeah. would probably be the highest risk. I asked you first, because uh, just only because of your experience in, in, uh, in Liberia, was there a certain area that was more susceptible from your point of view or? Um, yeah. Yeah, so it was almost always in the ED once patients had gotten behind triage. There was the assumption that patients, once they had gotten through triage, were definitely not infected, which uh, oftentimes with a disease that presents with fever and abdominal pain and diarrhea in West Africa, you know, it can be any number of things. So people would get behind, be, in, be infected, and then people wouldn't take basic uh, standard precautions, uh, and they would get exposed that way. And so I would have su suspected probably a similar pattern would emerge. Dr. Aspen, you're still muted. I see you're raising your hand. Thank you. Yes, and I just want to stress that point. Um, the, we created um, the international group that we have been meeting now for weeks every Friday just to learn um, the, uh, first from the countries that, that had a, a lot of this. And we put a document out about closing the back door. And uh, that's exactly what it is. They're, they, they uh, in Italy and Spain, they created basically a protocol to make sure that those patients that are in the hospital and not suspected to have COVID are interrogated in regular basis. And there's a form, it is in our website for those that want to see and their notes from the battlefield. Um, uh, but that is a very important point that needs to be stressed. Dr. Silla, you had a comment about this? You know, the ED is, is definitely a concerning environment, but I think the, 
I mean, the, the staff we know at, at our own hospital, we've had several anesthesia attending and staff being infected. I think they were, this is probably the highest, after nurses, it's probably the highest group of physicians who've been infected. Um, and this is really, there was in a setting of intubation. So intubation is by far the highest risk uh, procedure. And that's obviously mostly happens in the ER. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is about how much protection do you really need uh, for a COVID positive patient in a regular operation versus a tracheostomy? <clears throat> Dr. Machetti, could you handle that tracheostomy part? Um, so, you know, I outlined our recommendations for protection during a trach. Um, I think there are uh, you know, groups that have put forth recommendations for laparoscopic surgery and, and doing surgery, which is, is kind of not what we got into. Um, you have to do a, you know, a trach in a way that's, uh, if you do a trach under normal circumstances, there's uh, a guarantee, a virtual guarantee of splatter of droplets, if not on the provider, then in the immediate area. So that really uh, made us go forward with trying to get the really safest approach to recommend. Um, during surgery, uh, unless you're doing an aerosol generating procedure, um, it's, it would be difficult to operate with a papper on, although it's done. Um, we didn't really extend our recommendations to that environment, but I think others have. All right. Um, <clears throat> There's a couple of the questions that are on here and I think what we'll end up doing is we'll answer them and have them available. Um, there are some things that uh, aren't quite clear, uh, one with about a J1 visa, but I think the rest of them can be answered pretty effectively. And again, all this information will be available on the SAGES website. Uh, this entire webinar, all the uh, references that our speakers uh, uh, talked about, and then on the questions of the answers that were um, uh, given to us during the talk. Uh, we're about at an hour and a half right now, so I'm going to uh, turn the, the, uh, the microphone back to our president, the Dr. Aspen, uh, who will uh, end our webinar for us. Dr. Aspen. Thank you, Rob. I mean, it, it is pretty clear um, uh, how useful these these webinars are, particularly with the talks um, that we have heard. I mean, the, all the talks are fantastic from the scientific standpoint, but also the experiences. I want to particularly want to thank um, Dan and Pat. Uh, you not only gave your lecture, but you share a little bit of a piece of your soul tonight. And, um, and that is very appreciative. I mean, that's very much appreciated. Uh, you, you not only said what needs to be done, but also you said all the fears um, that you may have had. And um, we need to remember that, that fear and courage um, are not exclusive of each other, right? Um, they, it is totally normal for all of us to feel fearful, especially those that are being deployed and us that are still working and see uh, um, in proximity of patients that may have COVID. Um, nevertheless, we're still doing it. And um, to see that the community is appreciating it uh, with that nice video that Pat showed and the, 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 the shows of appreciation in many different forms and shapes, it keeps us going. The interesting thing is we do it every day, um, much before this COVID, and we will continue doing it forever. It's just nice to know now that um, it's being appreciated. Unfortunately, the risk to our own health is much more than usual. But as Pat nicely said, this will pass, and we all have to remember that. Thank you again for all, all the ones that joined, all the participants, and one more time, thank you to the, to the panelists for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Stay safe out there. <laughs>